it turns out that people are still interested in hearing about Hibernate, which is interesting. And perhaps I hadn't expected it. So this is an old project. Um, some of the interesting dates, some of the critical dates, the, the, the bits that I was around for, um, you look back and you see, you know, we're talking about a project that's been going for, you know, more than 20 years now. Um, so um, I, I want to talk to you a little, a little bit today about, um, about why this is still of interest and what we're doing to try and keep making it better. Um, first of all, I want to dispose of something that, that I still occasionally hear, which is, which is this idea that the reason developers use something like Hibernate is because they're scared of SQL, they're uncomfortable with using SQL, they're uncomfortable working with databases. This is my basic response to that. And um, because the real reason is that handwritten code which maps square result sets from the database to trees of Java objects is fragile, it's tedious, and it's boring. And by fragile, I mean when I make a tiny change to my data model for my program, uh, things go bad. I have, to, I have to go and accommodate that change by making lots and lots and lots of little changes all through my code base. Um, and furthermore, handwritten code like that is very difficult to optimize. And you know, just to J just to mention the first way in which it's difficult to optimize is that, is that handwritten code for data access, especially especially in combination with patterns like DAO or repository or whatever you guys want to call it these days, is extremely vulnerable to the, 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 the great monster of object persistence, which is n plus 1 selects. And I think we all know what that is, right? It's where I run a query and I get back results from a table, or maybe a couple of tables, and then I discover for each row, for each object in that result set, I need to go and fetch its associations, and I go and do that by, by going back to the database n times, or n is the size of the result set. Okay, so this is something we absolutely have to avoid. Um, and there is a basic strategy for avoiding it, okay? I'm going to say, say this right up front, all right? The basic strategy is that when you work with um, an object-oriented program which accesses a relational database, and, 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 and your, your whatever kind of little piece of program logic you're implementing, the way it has to work is you have to specify all the data that you're about to use in this piece of project lo pro program logic um, as part of the first, the initial query to the database, all right? Then you can go and start navigating your object graph. Okay, you want to make sure that you, ne that you almost, almost never trigger lazy fetching, lazy uh, initialization of, of, of one of the associations in that graph of objects. All right, how do you do that? How do you do this? Well, you have to use things like, uh, um, if you're using um, hybrid query language, DPAQL, you need to use uh, a fetch join in your initial query, for example. Okay, so, to put this a little bit in context, I got a quiz, you know, when I'm doing it with this, with this with less people, I ask for feedback from the audience, but I just want to ask you guys yourself this question on the board there, um, and, and answer it to yourself. When I'm designing a domain model, a, 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 a graph of associated classes in my, in my um, program, which is going to be this, uh, persisted by JPA, Hibernate, whatever, which association should I map lazy by default, and which association should I map eager by default? All right. Make sure you guys, every one of you has has some side of sort of an answer to that. All right. I've heard lots of different answers. All right. So my zeroth order answer is all of them should be lazy. Okay. And some people are surprised by this. Some people aren't. My first order answer is except for associations to what some people call reference data. I'm sorry, I don't know a better word for this. I don't have a better term for this. Okay, reference data is data in your program which, which, which changes almost never and which, we, and, and which there's a very small amount of it and we expect it to be sitting there in the second level cache. All right, those kind of things, you know, like, I don't know, country codes or something like that, pulling something stupid off the top of my head. Those kind of things we can stick um, in the second level cache and expect them to be there, and we can map those associations as eager. Um, now, did I just contradict myself? I started saying, you should never use lazy fetching, and then the very next slide, I said, you should map all your associations lazy. Is that a contradiction? Well, no, it's not. Avoiding lazy fetching at runtime 
is a very different statement to say, oh, then I should map all, I should map all my associations for eager fetching. Right? If I map all my associations for eager fetching, then I'm going to retrieve the whole database every time I, uh, or, or, or a massive subset of the database every time I run a query. Right? Uh, um, so, so, so we need lazy fetching to, to, to kind of um, to put bounds on the amount of data that we're going to retrieve in each query. But, but the eager fetching comes in in the specification of my query. All right. So now I'm going to argue a little bit about, you know, in, in favor of still using object relational mapping. The point is that if your ORM solution alleviates the pain involved in writing and optimizing, the, 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 the pain and discomfort and, and verbosity of writing 90% of the boring, you know, persistent logic, then that leaves you a whole lot more time to hand optimize the things that really do need optimization. All right? And the truth is that Hibernate and JPI were designed to work perfectly, uh, perfectly well in combination with handwritten SQL. All right? This is not a question of, I can use Hibernate or I can use handwritten SQL. It has never been about that, and, and it is not about that. Um, that said, for most interactions with the database, there is very little to be gained by hand, handwriting SQL um, um, and handwriting messy, the, the, the kind of the kind of messy, fragile code to marshal objects to um, object graphs from to and from um, um, query parameters and, and SQL result sets. Okay, there's a lot of other things you get. You get uh, second level cache, fancy fetching strategy, but this is like icing on the top. Um, now, at this point, what somebody usually wants to ask me about is, well, what about what I'm going to call row mappers? That's a stupid term. I don't know. I couldn't think of anything better. A row mapper is, let's say, a, 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 a simplified ORM, an ORM which lets you map, which lets you write some SQL query by, by hand and then map the result set of that SQL query to a class. Right? Doesn't do associations. It doesn't do dirty checking. It doesn't do several other things. So what I'm going to say, so first of all, I'm going to so show you a, a slide which is, which is garbage. I like totally made it up myself. And then I'm going to uh, you know, make an argument that, that you don't have to agree with, all right? I'm going to argue that when I start out writing, you know, developing a small program, very likely I have more tables than queries, or at least the same order. Okay. Very likely, I'm going to start out with about four. You know, for the very first screen of my application, I need about four or five tables in my program, but I only have a couple of queries. But over time, that changes. Over time, the number of queries in my program becomes much larger than the number of tables in my database. Okay. So row mappers. Let's see if I can operate this thing. Gah! So row mappers work great around about here, all right? They don't work so great once once we're up about here. Now, don't take too literally this. I think I've shown it, you know, kind of growing polynomially. In fact, both of them probably grow sublinearly. Okay, but I, I'm trying. I'm trying to. What I'm trying to point out is that as time goes on, this number of queries is much larger than the number of tables. Okay, and if I have to write a Java class that represents the result set of each of these queries, rather than a Java class which represents each of these tables, then over time, the schema of my data model gets smeared out across hundreds of classes in my program. Once again, make a tiny change to my data model. <laughs> All right. No, you guys say, oh, but my, data, my, my database never changes. OK, well, yeah, if you do things this way, you can't change your, your, your database. Um, actually, guys, there are techniques for refactoring databases, which we never hear about. If, we, if I tried to do a talk about that, it wouldn't get selected, right? Because we, we criminally, we're criminally ignorant of, of ways of, uh, of this kind of stuff. Nobody's interested in learning these kind of things. Um, there are ways to, make, to help, you know, make databases evolve. Um, so, OK. I'm not saying row mappers are bad. I'm just saying that there remain great advantages to object relational mapping, wrapping classes to tables. But there are, there are trade-offs, of course. And more than trade-offs, there are also some decisions we made decades ago that you know, I think we regret, and I think that we, you know, um, that, there, that I wish we had improved and, and revisited long ago. 
Um, so let's explore some of the sources of discomfort in, in Hibernate today, and, and, in J and, and, and by extension in JPA today. Um, you know, some of these sources of discomfort we're going to be able to fix, some of them we're not. Um, number one, the first source of discomfort is, is really simple, okay? It's another, it's an extra library to, to learn and understand, and, and the truth is a, 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 an ORM solution is a relatively compli complex library, okay? I'm not going to lie to you. It, it's, 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 it's a library with, with some magic and, and a lot to learn about it. You know, and the question is, is that going to be worth it? Um, you know, I mean, the truth is that this is a, you know, the, 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 the ORM library is, you know, more difficult to debug and to understand than your colleague's handwritten SQL code or handwritten row mapper code, um, though that depends a lot on, on your colleague. Um, the third issue is that, you know, in the past, and, and this is where I think we really messed up, um, you know, Hibernate was created in the context of, well, I'm not going to go into it, but um, error, error reporting was, was, was often bad, um, particularly for queries. Um, the, the old uh, query translator in Hibernate tended to take the effort that if it encountered something it didn't really understand, it would just throw it off to the database and let the database make what it, you know, make the best you know, it could of what it received. And that meant that very often you got some, you know, rather difficult to understand errors coming back from the database. Um, you know, and this, this grew out of the fact that the early versions of HQL didn't even have any, any sort of a specification. Um, the fourth problem I'm going to talk about is that um, some users struggle in dealing with managed entities and persistence contexts. And I understand that, you know, so that, that, that can be a struggle, right? Um, you know, in an ORM solution, you have this notion not of, of just some plain objects which I pass to and from the library to do stuff where, you know, when I say, you know, you know, excuse me, um, uh, insert, delete, update. I have these objects which are there associated with a context and um, operations against the database happen asynchronously compared to the operations that I perform. Some operations like updates are, are, um, are implicit and transparent. Um, you know, that, that, that's magic which can be difficult to understand. Um, above all, this is often expressed as a frustration with this guy, lazy initialization exception. Um, and Actually, this is a little unfair because handwritten code isn't necessarily fr isn't really free of this problem. I mean, if you write a query that um, retrieves data from the database and then you construct an object graph around it, um, that graph has to stop somewhere. Okay, Hibernate's lazy initialization exception is telling you you haven't fished, fixed, uh, fetched enough data. If you handwrote that code, you would get null pointer exception instead, which is not better. Um, Though in fairness, you know this row mapper solution which I talked about, where I have a where I have a, a, a class representing each um, result set, is isn't vulnerable to this problem. Okay, I've already told you the solution to this, right? On an earlier slide, I've just copied and pasted it right here. Specify the data you you're going to use in the initial query. Navigate the object draft. Avoid lazy fetching. But there's a third piece to it. Handle proxies. These, 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 things, these, these things in your object graph which represent unfetched data very carefully when you're serializing your object graph to and from, say, JSON or whatever it is. Um, a problem is that there was no completely well-defined API for this for 20 years. Um, and that is almost embarrassing. Um, some people figured out kind of how to solve the problem where, by looking at fi finding some things internal in Hibernate which were not completely pro you know, published APIs and other people just never did. Um, where we absolutely did go wrong in this respect was that we have never really communicated or promoted the idea of using stateless session, right? Stateless session offers this programming model which is much more similar to the programming model of handwritten code or of row mappers where, where, you, where you pass an object and you say, you know, insert or update or delete this object, right? Um, which is quite difficult, and, 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 and it's, you know, sta it's stateless because it has no persistence context, all right? There's much less magic in a stateless session. Um, so, so stateless session can be really helpful in the cases where the persistence context starts getting in the way. Number five. The query language was far behind kind of modern SQL as it exists today. Worse than that, 
Um, it featured some lack of portability between relational databases um, in the sense that, for example, you needed to know what, you needed to use different function names on different databases if you wanted to, I don't know, do string manipulation or something. Um, Hybrid query language started out more like a lowest common denominator abstraction of SQL as it existed, you know, a couple of decades ago. And JPA improved the situation a little bit, but JPA's moved, you know, slowly. Um, and this was sort of fine, right? The missing features were the kind of things which aren't so often used in your typical OLTP type program, which Hibernate really is the sweet, where Hibernate ORM is really the sweet spot. Um, so, you know, it kind of, you know, it's kind of okay, but not. Um, you know, more generally, I think that Hibernate did a much less good job than it should have at hiding little idiosyncrasies and differences between relational databases. Um, this was kind of a missed opportunity, you know, people, you know, partly because we never saw you know, when people would say, oh, the reason to use ORM is to get portability across databases, we always, mm, well, no, that's not the reason to use it, okay? On the other hand, it can be a nice side effect, and by not, by not um, you know, by not really going all the way, I think, you know, we, you know, undermine the value of that nice side effect. Um, another thing I think, you know, where I really went wrong was to kind of go with the flow and kind of tell people to do something or at least, you know, go along with them doing something that I always thought I knew was wrong, right? Um, we let people, you know, we, uh, th and it didn't come from us. There was this, uh, you know, idea around in the air that, that, you know, if people were worried about tying their persistence layer to Hibernate, that the way they could, you know, decouple their persistence layer from Hibernate was by writing these Deo objects, right? This, this, this persistence layer of objects which perform persistence operations for, for particular classes. And um, first of all, it, it didn't really work, right? Because the, the whole the whole programming model with a, with, with a persistence context and managed objects where you know updates are implicit and all those other things, is it, quite different from the programming model if you're using handwritten SQL or a row mapper and you call update operations yourself. So it didn't really work, but you can find in all sorts of books which will tell you that this is the way to decouple your program logic from your persistence layer, and, and it's actually not true. And 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 I, I think I always kind of knew it wasn't true and. And you know, I've never, but I just went with the flow. So you know, that was that was a mistake. You know, sometimes you need to just get up and be the asshole who tells everyone they're wrong. Um, and worse than the fact that it doesn't work, in a lot of cases, it's just extra superfluous, sur superfluous complexity. Um, Beyond that, Deo isn't even obviously the best, you know, if you think you do need something extra sitting between your program and your, and, and, and your ORM, Deo isn't obviously the best way, you know, active record is, mm, I don't know, preferable perhaps, at least for some people. Last problem I'm going to talk about is that um, it's impossible in traditional JPA um, to access the database using non-blocking I.O. Um, Hibernate JPA were designed around um, blocking JDBC and all the APIs are blocking and um, if you're a user who, use, if you're a developer who's working with um, reactive streams in a reactive program, um, um, then that's not good enough. As soon as you try to hit your database, you're, you're, losing, you're losing that whole reactive model. So. At this point, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what um, we have done in Hibernate 6. I cannot really do it justice in 25 minutes. Right? Um, there is a huge amount that's new and changed. Um, the basic idea is that every once in a while, it's time to break shit. And yeah, you're all going to hate me. And I make no apologies, all right? Um, sometimes you need to own up to your mistakes and fix them. 
Um, so we have really spent time reflecting, you know, re rethinking, refreshing all the um, program-facing interfaces in Hibernate, um, the annotations, um, and we've even completely removed some older APIs, um, in particular the Criteria API. Um, we're now supporting Jakarta Persistence, so the namespace has changed, and JPA3. Um, I should clarify a little, when I say that we're breaking everything, um, if you have, if you're a user, if you have a program that's using Hibernate and you have constrained your usage of Hibernate to purely to the stuff that's defined by the JPI specification, then nothing will break. Right? Um, but if you've gone beyond what's in JPA, which I think is the common case, and you're using um, additional features in some places, um, you, you may run into breakage. We have a brand new implementation of the Hibernate query language. Okay, and uh, this is wonderful. I can't, you know, it's really difficult for me to do, it, do justice. What an important um, advance that is. Many new features and much greater portability between relational database systems. Um, something really important. There's much stricter type check. There's much better type checking of your query, you know, before it's sent to the database. You get much, much more meaningful errors. Um, it's probably not perfect still, but that, that, that is something that will continue to improve over time now that we have this new, you know, this new infrastructure for doing things. Um, we have you know, a huge suite of portable functions which abstract over all the variations um, between different relational databases. You know, I spent like pff, huge time do you know, building a catalog of all the functions on every one of these databases and then emulating the, this one on this and, and um, um, there's, a, there's actually a lot of work in that, and that means that you can you can safely use um, you know the, there's a there's a big list of, of, of functions um, built into um, HQL which you can use safely across databases. Um, some of them we already contributed back to the the JPA spec and is already out there in the new in the new revision of JPA. Um, far better support for dates and times, including a whole system for doing date time arithmetic, which perhaps that's not something you often do in a, in a, in a, in a, in a query, um, but it's nice to have it there. Um, there is much better support for report style query, well, there's, uh, there is support for um, <laughs> report style queries, um, by which I mean things like union, unions, um, window functions, uh, or it's set aggregate functions, better support for subqueries, all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to go on about this. Probably for many people, this is not very relevant, but for some people, it, it's, it's probably a bit relevant. You know, maybe you've got a couple of places in your program where, where, the, where this will be helpful, where it saves you the effort of having to um, handwrite some SQL. Um, the old Criteria API is gone, um, and all the new stuff in HQL is available via extensions to um, JPA's Criteria API. Um, in fact, the whole thing's been turned around and, and HQL now compiles to JPA criteria objects. Okay. Wow, a superset of JPA criteria objects, which is the right way to do things, of course. Um, um, we spent a lot of time working on the dialects um, to achieve much, greater, much better portability. In particular, I spent time making sure that Hibernate now generates much higher quality DDL with all the right column lengths, with check constraints and all that stuff. You know, of course, I'm still not telling you that you should use schema export to um, export the schema to your production database, but even so, it's, it's nice that this is now a, this is now a tool that actually, that actually um, produces high quality DDL. Um, in particular, we moved away um, from the use of column definition to kind of um, um, embed a little bit of vendor-specific SQL in the, in the annotations. Um, there's a whole rework type system in Hibernate 6, um, making it much easier to customize type mappings between Java types, you know, the, 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 like the field, Java field types and column types. Um, again, the point here is to move away from stringly type mappings, okay, and to using um, um, type safe way of expressing these mappings. Uh, and there's a whole lot more which, I, which I'm not going to, uh, a new feature which I'm not going to get into. Um, the other new thing is Hibernate Reactive. Sadly, we're currently, well, we're currently working actively on getting Hibernate Reactive working on um, Hibernate 6. 
on the Hibernate 6 code base. Currently, Hibernate Interactive, sadly, only supports Hibernate 5. Um, so, what's the point of this? JDBC is blocking, so we need something different. All right? The something different is the Vertex database clients for these databases, Postgres, MySQL, Maria, DB2, SQL Server, Oracle, Cockroach. Your database probably is on that list. Um, maybe not, but probably. So Vertex, so this is a whole new tech, this is a whole new re-implementation of database connectivity for Java in the Vertex project, completely based on non-blocking I.O. Sometimes people misunderstand this and think that somehow it's still blocking somewhere under the covers. It's using JDB. No, no, there's no, there's no, blo there's no blocking I/O in this. Um, and reactive streams, right? Here you have a choice between using Java's built-in completion stage or using a project called Mutiny, um, which is part of, um, which is what we're using in Quarkus. Um, this is an open-ended list. We could add additional reactive stream implementations fairly easily, um, but these are the things which um, we're offering at the moment. So let's see, let's see what this looks like. Look, I mean, hands up if you like reactive. Two people, three, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, so I mean, it's kind of bad, right? But what surprised me is that, you know, after getting used to it a little bit and writing some code, it's kind of less bad than I expected. Um, it's kind of tolerable, right? Which was surprising, which surprised me. I thought it would be intolerable, but, but it's tolerable. Um, so let's see, see some code using Hibernate Reactive, all right? So the first bit, we'll just get a session and we'll retrieve an author from the database. Pretty straightforward. Nothing, nothing, nothing new to see there. In, in, in regular Hibernate, that would just ret re return you an instance of author. Um, now, we want to navigate an association. And here's where we see where the difference is. I don't get an, uh, what I get back from that call to find isn't an author object, it's an instance of React. It's, uh, let's say it's a mutiny uni, right? Uh, 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 I, um, an, an, an object which I can, which will give me an author. So I use chain to say, you know, when that's available, give me the author, which I want to do something with. And then here we see a big difference between Hibernate Reactive and regular Hibernate. If I want to lazy fetch something, that's an explicit operation, right? Because lazy fetching is something that happens in the non-blocking blocking fashion, asynchronously or whatever. So we can't make, so it can't be transparent, right? So that so that becomes an explicit operation: fetch the books of this author. Now, you might think that's really bad, but actually, one of the first things we notice is that actually it's kind of good, right? <laughs> to be able to see where lazy fetching is happening in your program, right? Especially if you go back to you know uh, what I said earlier, right? It's actually kind of good. <laughs> Um, at the next step in the chain, I'll receive the books back, and then I can do something with them. Yeah. Not so bad. Yeah, it gets worse for more complicated things, um, but you know, it's not so bad. Um, what's wrong with this code? Of course, I'm doing lazy fetching. Now, Almost everyone I talked about Hibernate Reactive starts off, and, and including myself, right? And initially, including when we were first thinking about this, we thought that one of the things we were going to want to be able to do with Reactive is streaming result sets bit by bit across the wire from the database. Okay, it's an obvious thing that you think that Reactive that's, that streams must be about. Um, and I'm going to say that's absolutely not what this is about. All right. Even if this was or is possible on some database protocols, which I think largely it's probably not, right? What's the first rule of building uh, multi-tiered programs that I learned as a baby Java developer? It's don't hold a transaction or a result set 
open on the database across user think time or across any interaction time. That's the basic rule, right, of scalability. So we don't want to hold a cursor open on the database. There's no, we have no reason to do that, right? We can use pagination or whatever if we need to go, go and fetch data in chunks, all right? There's no, intuitively, at least intuitively, I can't see any, you know, I mean, I str I've tried to come up with a circumstance where it would make sense to open up a cursor and then stream bits of rows across the database, across the, across the wire slowly. And I, and, I, and, I can't, and I can't think of anything, all right? So it's not about this, all right? The interaction with the database happens in a non-blocking fashion, which is to say that the, um, that the remote call, that the, that the we're in a process or remote call to the database server happens without blocking the thread on the client. But it doesn't, but, 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 but apart from that, it's just a, 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 a request and a response and you get back a single result set. Um, I want to say that, you know, um, Look, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm really not an expert, but it's clear that reactive is not automatically faster. Um, you know, it doesn't make, it's not this thing that you can add to your program to make it go fast. Um, and look, first of all, look, I know you guys do this, right? <laughs> and it's so wrong, right? It's garbage. You've got to stop. But I know you do. All right. I do it. So if you write a benchmark <coughs> and run it on your laptop with a database running on your laptop and a tiny data set of like 100 rows that's sitting 100% in the database's, database's cache in memory, there's no reason, I mean intuitively, there's no possible reason why you could possibly expect to obtain any advantage from using Hibernate Reactive. I mean, that's just analytically seems sensible to me, maybe I'm wrong. But, but it doesn't seem sensible that reading some data from memory from my machine is gonna be something that's gonna block the thread for, for an appreciable amount of time, right? So don't, so don't expect to be able to like, you know, run this thing on your, on your, on your, on your laptop and, and see some advantage to using Reactive, okay? I, 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 I mean, you know, you do, this is not even the way to, you know, to benchmark regular hibernate, um, because it, it's, it's just completely wrong and bad. Um, on the other hand, it's easy enough for us to invent some, I don't know, contrived situations. There's a particular benchmark that everybody loves and everybody competes to have the best numbers on. And I'm not going to say its name because it's garbage. Um, <laughs> but we did a, because it's what everybody looks at these days, we spent, we've invested a shocking amount of time and money in optimizing our products with this benchmark. Um, and, and it's garbage. Um, however, it is possible for us with this contrived garbage benchmark, you know, I could put up, I could stand up here and put up some graphs which show reactive, you know, scaling to twice the number of concurrent requests as, as regular classic hibernate, all right? And I could do that and, and I'd be lying to you. It, it'd, be, it'd be nonsense, okay? So I'm not going to do that, all right? What I'm going to say is, as I always say, right, what you should do if you care about performance is you should do the performance testing in a realistic deployment environment, in your deployment environment, under load with a real, ac with a real data set, and, and, you know, that toy benchmarks aren't going to tell you anything useful at all. Um, you know, is a typical... Application going to benefit from going reactive all, all everywhere? My prejudice is to say, no, almost certainly not. Okay. However, there are people who have systems where uh, I had some anecdote, but I'm terrible at remembering anecdotes. Some guys who, if they like, eat you know 0.1 percent extra performance out of their system, they saved millions of dollars a month. Right? If you're that guy then you'd be stupid to not try this out, okay? If you're not that guy, you know, eh, maybe not. <laughs> Finally, um, <clears throat> um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Quarkus. Um, hopefully this doesn't sound too much like an advertisement. Um, uh, Hibernate integrates very nicely with Quarkus. Um, why 
why do I care about Quarkus in the context of Hibernate? Um, apart from the fact that it pays for my, you know, food and rent. Um, what makes Hiber what makes Quarkus very interesting from the point of view of Hibernate is that in Quarkus, all that annotation, scanning, and validation, and building up of the meta model which describes my persistent classes that Hibernate typically does at system startup time is now something that happens at build time. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that you guys are somewhat familiar with how Quarkus works. Maybe not. How many people have used Quarkus here? A good, okay, a good number. How many people have been to a talk about it? Okay, good. Well, okay. No, not everyone, though. So basically, <laughs> let's see if I can <coughs> describe this without embarrassing myself or using lots of wrong words. Um, um, so the build process of Quarkus spits out an image with all the initialization of the application already built in, burned into that image. Okay, so when you start the program, all that stuff that usually happens at, at um, to, you know, just to set up and initialize the, the you know, Hibernate or other libraries or the, or the you know, the, the um, Rest Easy or whatever, has already been done. Okay? I said, I hope I didn't just embarrass myself there. Um, that means that, that, you know, I mean, obviously Hibernate does a, does a whole lot of work at, at, at startup time, you know reading and validating and building all these, you know, this meta model and then another layer, building all these persistence and all that stuff. When using Quarkus, all that stuff happens um, at, at build time. That's very important if you're writing um, 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 cloud native systems, right? This means that you can spin up your, your program like that and a new instance of your program like that. Um, another thing is, is, we, is, you know, we just, get the chance to um, compile a program using Hibernate um, to native code, um, and we get all the nice stuff like dead code elimination, yada, 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 yada. Um, this is good, right? Like, um, this, this takes work, right? Making, you can't just take any old library, especially a library like Hibernate, which is so dependent upon reflection and metaprogramming for everything, and run it on GraalVM, okay? Um, that's, that's, that's extra work. That, that's, that's, you know, real uh, meaningful integration work that it, that it takes to do that. And that's what you get with Quarkus. Um, and the, the other point is that it's just a really unique developer experience of working with Quarkus that is something that's completely, almost completely entirely foreign to, or has been entirely foreign to Java development for many years. Um, of this, you know, just making changes and immediately seeing the results of those changes, including to configuration. And, uh, um, um, and you, if you haven't tried it out, you, you've really got to try it out. It's, it's, actually, it's actually really, really fantastic. Um, Hibernate Reactive is also integrated in Quarkus, and that means that we have, you know, we can offer you a stack that's reactive absolutely from top to bottom, right? You have Rest Easy, Rest Easy Reactive, which is a reactive implementation of JAX-RS. Um, you have Hibernate Reactive, and that's running on top of Mutiny and Vertex, right? So, so, under, so that these, these bottom layers, which are, you know, which are not that, well, this bottom layer, which is, this isn't necessarily the layer you interact with, these are the, the, the layers you interact with, um, you know, is, is, you know, a real solid implementation of, you know, of reactive non-blocking, um, uh, reactive and non-blocking server. Um, so top to bottom. Additionally, um, there's a, you know, I mentioned active record briefly earlier. Um, Quarkus has a, you know, if you're one of these people who feels like you do need something that's in between your program and um, um, the, and, and the persistence layer, and the, you know, Entity Manager API or Session API. Um, Quarkus has a, a framework called Panache, which is an implementation of Active Record for Hibernate and also for Hibernate Reactive, um, which is quite nice and, and different. You know, obviously it's a very different model to DAOs, repositories, whatever you call them, um, but, but, it, but it's interesting. Um, Hibernate 6 is coming very soon, hopefully, to Quarkus. Um, um, currently, Quarkus is on Hibernate 5, but, but we are working furiously to make that, that happen. Okay. Um, 
I've got 10 minutes for questions. Come on. Don't be scared. I know there's a lot of people. Yes? So you talk a lot about the integration with books. Are mm. you also looking into Python mode and Spring Native? And so uh, for hi specifically for Hibernate Reactive? Yeah, so they, that's something that, um, in principle, they can, they can do. Um, Hibernate Reactive is quite... It's architecturally designed so that we can um, integrate with different um, streaming APIs and different... Um, for example, there's a, they have a different um, set of non-blocking uh, libraries for accessing the database. Um, in principle, it can be done. Currently, they, don't, they haven't done that work. So in, in principle, it's possible, eventually. Yes? I read your post about Java Loom. Do you have any activities about it? Is uh, your code ready for instance? About Loom? Yeah. Um, so that's something we're investigating quite a lot in terms of in the context of Quarkus and um, there's lots of opinions, lots of divergent opinions around right now about it. Um, we, we, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what's going to come of that. We're doing testing and we're going to see um, Loom is obviously part of the future and I mean, in a sense for us, I mean, it would be a hell of a lot nicer <laughs> to get the advantage of non-blocking without the, you know, bad, but maybe not all that bad, program model or reactive. It would be wonderful. Whether it's really that straightforward is unclear. Mm. Yes? The state of caching, mm -hmm. is that something that has to do with uh, implicit caching? Uh, is it, has it have to do with implicit caching? What do you mean by implicit caching? You mean the first level cache, the, the persistence context? The second level, I can yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, exactly, right. So a stateless session is a, a session like API, which has no persistence context, which has no first level cache, precisely, right? So, so th and, and that really is, you know, I'm not sure if I explained it that well, perhaps I didn't explain it very well, but that, that really is a source of some people's discomfort with using an ORM solution compared to using these kind of more command-oriented APIs and, and, you know, that are just like, you know, more close to the metal interaction with the database, right? So stateless session's been there for decades. It's been there for a long time, right? We've improved it a little bit, but it, but it was really, but it's always been fine, right? And it's just, it's just something that's there that you can use whenever you want to use it. Um, you know, it has advantage, right? If you, especially if you have, you know, sometimes you run into performance problems because you load a lot of objects in a session, right? And all that data gets stuck there in the first level cache until the transaction ends. Well, with stateless session, that doesn't happen. It doesn't, there's no second level cache. The objects are always detached. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So do the React part use the same connection or perhaps perhaps a new connection for each of the clients or working in parallel? Uh, there is a connection pool managed by Vertex. Um, oh, you got me, man. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say things which are wrong. <laughs> but um, yeah, essentially... Ask the, question again, ask the question again so I can very carefully answer the particular... Yes. Uh, running simultaneously, would we then have a thousand connections? The question is, when I'm using Hibernate Reactive, right, um, do I have a connection per client which is waiting, or am I able to multiplex um, requests across a single connection? Exactly. <sighs> It's embarrassing that I can't give a straight answer to that question right now. Um, there is some there is some support for multiplexing. I think it depends upon whether there is a tra whether there is a, whether you start a transaction or not. Um, um, I believe that there are there are cases where you need to where you need to have a connection per per transaction. Even so, but also I wouldn't be surprised if that depends upon the database. The pro the people to ask that to direct that question to are the folks developing the Vertex client. Yeah. Uh, isn't your slide 
about authors and books and perfect example of n plus one antipattern. How many queries are there? Yes, yes, that's what I said. Yeah. I had a little uh, thing which came up. What's wrong with this code? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it did have that problem. Yeah. What about the multi-text exception when you try to uh, lazy join more than one collection? About multi what? Uh, multi-bag. Multi-bag. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's an issue about that that I thought people were working on right now, isn't it? I, I saw some email about that. <laughs> yeah, but there was an issue where the cardinality of the bags came out incorrect when you had a Cartesian product between bags, right? Yeah, they're working, they're working on that right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. All right, any more? There's still five minutes. We could still talk more if you guys want. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.